Welcome to another episode of the Rugby League Outsiders. This week we're going to chat to Jed Corkin, who's the head coach of Irish Rugby League. He's also got a huge history in the game. Jed comes from Ireland and moved across to uh, to England when he was just five years old. And he talks a lot about his struggles there, uh, getting into the game, not being selected for the Irish team by Daryl Powell. And, and also the honour of playing alongside huge players like Barry McDermott, Tez, Mc, Tez O'Connor. Just a really, really good episode. And it's all for our St. Patrick Day's special. Okay, Jed, thank you very much for taking a little bit of time out of your busy day, because I know you've got a busy day doing your, uh, your training here, um, yep. at, the, at the training for the, for the Ireland squad. Uh, I just really want to get a bit of a, an understanding of your background and your route into your coaching position with the Ireland squad. Uh, started back in 2004, so I'm currently on my 20 year anniversary this year. Uh, funny enough, ironically enough. Uh, started in October 2004. Um, missed out on selection for the for the European Games with Powell, Daryl Powell, and it came to the selection process and one of my teammates at the time, Halifax, got picked and I got missed out. And, and, and you know, I've been chasing that dream for two or three years prior to that. And when he got picked and I got missed on selection, you know, I queried it with Powell. And, and there's a funny story to it with Powell. I rang him, he was, they were on the way back from Swansea after playing Wales and I were a bit hot-headed on the phone with him because I naffed off and upset I wasn't picked or selected and uh, Barley just like, it's a simple fix Jed come down to training next week in Leeds and we'll have a chat bring your documents with you and we'll get you signed up and we'll get you playing he said I love everything about what you are your passion how you've just spoken to me on the phone not many players in my career already have challenged me like that but you know and uh, yeah, and the rest is history went down to Leeds met him introduced me to the squad I knew some of the players anyway from playing against or playing with um, but just getting to meet your players, Barry McDermott, Shaterry Connors, established players like Phil Cantillon, etc. It was a, it was a, a wide, you know, rude awakening and one that I was, you know, really excited about. And then, you know, 20 years later, I'm now head of my national team and you know, I'm very proud and very feel very privileged to be in this position after representing my country. Not only getting to play for your country, but to, to head coach it is, is just something different. Was there ever a time when you thought like rugby league will never really get established in Ireland, and you know, glad now that it that it has? Yeah, it's still, it's still slow progress. You know, there's a lot of good people involved now. Um, there's been there's been great people involved in the past, in you know, in my time, but just not the continuity needed to get us where we're going. Um, you know, and the people that we've got currently involved from the board level to the to the grassroots games. Uh, club sorry is that they're good people and they want the same thing that we want from an from an elite performance side of things and they now see and trust that there's a process for players to be selected uh, because I do believe not now but in, in the near future that, that we do have a number of homegrown players that can represent our national team at the highest level Can we talk a little bit about your background and your route to England and then and then have a look at your your playing career as well? Yeah, my, dad, my dad's an ex-serviceman, left the Irish Army. Uh, I moved to England when I was five. Um, you know, that was a big transition in itself. You know, a different country, a different way of life. You know, we were typical Bifos, you know, big ignorant efforts from from Offaly, like in Tullamore, you know. Bifos. The Bifos, yeah, that's what that's what I was always renowned as, the bit all the end of the Bifos, and, you know, and that's just an Offaly term and, you know, typical country thing, but... Um, you know, it was just, it was a tough transition. You know, I remember being kids going to school over here was completely different. Yeah. You know, having the t the way teachers were different, the, the, the kids were different, you know. Um, you know, we were brought, we were brought up and I st stressed brought up in a traditional Irish household, strict mother, firm father, you know, discipline and, and all that was in place and respect and, you know, and then there was different concepts of stuff from, friends and you know people that we were hanging around with and but yeah you know it's something I've never regretted it's something I've really enjoyed coming across I've lived in different countries but moving over here at five it was a it was a tough transition for us as a family but one that we had to do and the one that we've done and you know one that now I'm settled with my own family and you know something that I regularly speak to my daughter and my son about and the wife's a big part of it as well she's well she has no choice really uh, <laughs> because she's been part of it for a long time but the kids are very proud of the heritage you know especially my daughter my daughter's mad on rugby league especially the national teams and you know she, she she's an encyclopedia of rugby league you know she knows all the nrl players nrlw girls you know she's she's like an encyclopedia on rugby league and you know i often joke saying you should have been a boy but you know she's a very proud woman with her own beliefs and 
a very strong mindset and I'm immensely proud of both my kids but you know it's 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 been a bit of a whirlwind you know I, I sometimes pinch myself coming from Ireland to here and the ways of life have been different but one that I probably never change you know yeah. I've enjoyed every minute of it to be honest and Jeb what was your route into rugby league what what, <laughs> what age did you start playing uh, probably about seven or eight funny enough um, the wife uh, the father-in-law was my first rugby league coach I never never even dreamt of settling down with a wife or have, you know we were just friends for a long time and many years but yeah the first coach I had Bob Smithies and Dave Reed were my first coaches and I remember sitting down on what, the field what club was that? Spotland Rangers right Spotland Rangers they don't exist anymore they went they went out of uh, they went out of a long time ago but you know I sat on the bank for two or three a week trying to build the courage up to get involved and and then I go home tell me dad about oh dad you know it's different it's like it's like Hurley and Slitter but <laughs> it's like football but it's not football and he couldn't grasp what I was trying to get to he said come down next week dad and he finished work he took me down we sat on the bank in and then Bob Smithies came over and said son do you want to come and join in I've been watching you sat on the bank for weeks and you know do you want to join in and my dad said get in there son you know go and show him what you got and I ripped in and I loved I fell in love with it instantly just fell in love with the camaraderie with the lads and the joking were different to school life and you know just having that same thing in common just really got us on the same page and never looked back since it's, it's mad how you know that moment there where you, you, your coach came across and just said something and your dad give you a little nudge you know go give it a try if that never happened who knows where, be. where you'd be now and mm. do, do you have visions of being that person for other people now yeah you know I, my ethos is that I want people to have the experiences I've had not just in life, but through the game. And the great experiences that this game gives you, you know, going to different countries, meeting different people, getting to understand different cultures and, you know, how you embrace them as a person. Uh, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm big on giving people opportunities or wanting people to have the same opportunities that I had, but even, you know, bigger and better opportunities. Why not? You know I mean? Why, why stop someone from daring to dream? You know, the, the ceiling's a limit or the sky's a limit, as they say. I use terminology, the ceiling's a limit, but go and maximise your ceiling, go and reach that ceiling and then the rest is yours. You know mm. what I mean? And I can see that in your coaching. Uh, we've been watching you sort of coaching the, the students earlier. Obviously, your first team coach. Um, you know, how much does it mean to you to bring these the pathways through the, the, the students of Ireland? I think it's important that they get like I don't think of myself any different to any of the other coaches, Glenn, yeah. you know, Ryan, uh, sorry, Brendan, uh, you know, you know, I don't see myself or feel any different to any of them. I think it's important that the players see that we're all one. Yeah. You know, that they're approachable, I'm approachable and vice versa. I think it's it's important as they develop and they come through the age groups that they get that continuity with them coaches as they step up. Our system's the same system, the calls are the same calls. You know, the terminology and, and expectations are all the same. You know, whether you're playing students, whether you're playing the 16s, the 19s, you know, the A's, the women's, you know, the senior men's, everything now is is unified as one. And, I, you know... I, you know, it's funny because the media picked up on it in the World Cup. Oh, well, why are you picking those shields up? And, you know, the national head coach, why are you doing that? Well, why shouldn't I do that? Yeah. yeah. What makes me any different to my assistant coach, Joe Callan, or, you know, to my team manager, Adam Bates? If they're good enough and capable enough of doing it, why shouldn't I do it? And I think that sets a demeanour amongst the players that, as coaches, we're not above and beyond in terms of mucking in. You know, we're big on housekeeping and the way we find things and big on pressure, how people you know, perceive us as a national team and a national yeah. programme. So I, I, I thrive off how people think, you know, what you're saying there, how I am with my players. I, there's a lot more coaching involved at these levels than there is at the senior men's because obviously the professional players are playing at an elite level, but it's important that they get the same love and this, get the same expressions and the same detail that what I give to my senior men's players. Um, so their journey is easier, you know, they, they integrate better with, and easier with the other players. And then the journey on them is just as they step up is evolving the skills at every every level they go up. Jed, obviously the culture of a of a team is is massive, and th this seems bigger than a team. From you know from looking on the outside this time, it's you know you've got the women sport very well, very proud. You know what I mean? Very excited about the future. Obviously, you've got a load of students out there as well that are obviously really keen to get stuck in. So, what what is the if you could describe the culture? How would you describe the culture of the Ireland team? I called you, we're, we're a very proud team, we're a very proud country, but as a country in ourselves, we're a very patriotic country. You'll see St. Patrick's Day is celebrated globally, you know, it's around the world. It's not just in Dublin, it's not just in the UK. You go to America and it's, if, if not bigger, over there than it is in, in our homeland. But, you know, we're a very proud 
and very passionate country, you know, uh, and that's something I breed in or, you know, emphasise within my coaching philosophy is that, and I used it when, <laughs> they laugh and joke now, they take the mitt, but, you know, when I first met me playing squad going into the World Cup prep, I had one session with the World Cup team leading up to going into camp for the World Cup, believe it or not. Nobody know, not many people know that except for the players, but when I sat down the boys and it were actually in Hotwood College here, you know, we, we greeted here and in that one session, and I used the terminology, if we were going to war like I knew the country is now, I'd be at the front of the queue. I would be ready to take the bullet for my countrymen and countrywomen as the next man would. And that's the mindset I need to understand is that we're all equal, we're all here for the same thing, to, to experience the same thing, but also fight for the same thing. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm a very proud man, I'm a very proud countryman and, you know, I've got the values instilled from me, from my, my parents, because again, I was brought up and not dragged up. And, and I think that's, I think that's just a cultural thing within us Irish people. Um, so again, everybody knows everybody within our pathways program from the 16s up to the seniors. And I think it's important that they do understand who those players are because they, even though we want them to idolise them, I think it's important that they understand what strengths they've got as players. Not that we want them to mirror them, but we want them to be better than them. So we've got that production line constantly coming through. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I love my players, I love my staff. You know, I, I don't treat my players and staff any different. I'm firm but fair, I'm firm but kind. Uh, but I also respect all, everybody, you know, from players to staff. Um, but yeah, just, you know, I, we try and evolve every year. We're evolving this year, as I've just said out to the boys outside, you know, we need to level up this year. We had a great introduction last year, you know, it was the first time we've implemented everything at Pathways level. And we had a great year. You know, it's the closest we've come to winning the Four Nations for a long time in the Pathways, and if ever. And, you know, we were a couple of points shy of winning it in the 18s, 19s. And, you know, that was making a legacy in itself. And as I've just challenged them outside there, that was last year. That's forgotten about now. We're on to this year. And this is what we're about making memories and, you know, creating your own new legacy for going forward. And it's funny because some of the boys that have been picked up off the programme from last year now, they're in academy setups. They've signed semi professional contracts. and. You know, it's it's nice now to see that our family's growing, not just at grassroots level, but in the professional game. And for me, it just stamps the flag in the ground even more and makes it more firmer that you can create a journey and a dream out of whether you're a, a boy like Ron and Michael from Balbriggan or, you know, like myself from Offley, and you can come and, and, and get an opportunity to play the greatest game in the world. Mm -hmm. What are the immediate goals then for, for Ireland in the next... So immediate goals and then future goals for Ireland? Per, my personal or, or as an organisation? No, for the, as an organisation. Continuity, I think we need to improve the standard of the game, for one. I think the level of the competition back home, the, the depth of that competition, you know, and then from an international perspective, is produced those players into international honours. You know, that's one, one that I'm very firmly you know, driven towards, uh, you know, just off last year's Pathways programme, I, I could hand, easily handily pick 11 players from grassroots level last year. Yeah. But the concerning figure on that for me is, out of those 11 players, how many are actually playing the grassroots game? Yeah. That's really worrying for mm -hmm. me, yeah. you know. And, if, and, and us coaches trying to push them into clubs, our biggest hurdle we have back in Ireland is that they play rugby union, they play the hurling, they play football, and and... The personal endorsements they get from that, it's hard to compete with. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're coming up against big organisations, you know, players were getting torn off last year for playing rugby league. They were falling out with the clubs, but they, when they picked up their rugby ball and came to the first league session to try out, they had no intentions of staying, but once they came to the first session, yeah. they killed Dara, they fell in love with it instantly. Yeah, yeah. And that's where the, the friction started with the clubs. Uh, but so again, I'd like to see a bit more continuity. I'd like to see a lot more good people come in at the grassroots, I don't like calling it domestic, it drives me mad. Because what's drove me mad over the years is that we've had the segregation of domestic and heritage. For me, if you're Irish, you're Irish. And your law will determine whether you're an Irishman or not, or an Irish woman, a lady or not. Because if you play for a World Cup, you'll come back the year after. And then you'll come back the year after. And we've had plenty of players like that. But we've also had the number of players that just want to turn up for World Cups. And, yeah. I, and I get that, and we've got to understand that. Yeah. But for me, they're the ones that cause the political debate. And that's something that I, I quashed out last year and I challenged the players in the World Cup year is that I'll judge you not just off this year, I'll judge you off next year when you come back. And if you don't, I promise you for a fact I'll cut you. Mm. We're making the decisions. Us as coaches are now making them decisions. You as players have had control for too long. We as coaches are going to make that decision now as performance. And I'll judge you as a, as a countryman if you come back next year. And, and let's just say we had 
we had a lot of players after that World Cup year wanting to play last year and you know what happened last year happened last year and you know hopefully we can get back on the horse this year and the club support the players shall I say uh, yeah. and, and let's see where we go Jed, if you could cast your mind back over the last, you know, as long as you've been involved with the national squad, what are a couple of standout moments where you thought, you know, that I'm really proud or this, you know, this will, this memory will go with me for the rest of my time? Yeah, there's my debut, uh, Scotland in Navan, which I'll, you know, I'll take to my grave. It was a very special moment, not for me, but for my family and, and the bloodline. But uh, the World Cup year in then away, you know, when I debuted in a World Cup and got to play against some of the, you know, the, the NRL stars and the world-class players that were on stage that year. And uh, and then becoming, you know, the national head coach was a, it was an immensely proud moment for me on the, under difficult circumstances because coming through and working with the coaches that I worked with and a close relationship with them. Uh, I loved it and embraced it and, and we had great connection as coaches, but there was always that missing factor of being Irish for me, you know, um, and understanding your own culture is a big thing and that's something that I've in line with us um, as I've took over. But yeah, we've had, I've had many, per, you know, personal moments, great moments, great teammates, great coaches, great, you know, you know, great staff members, but I just think the international debut and then becoming national head coach is two of the specialist things. Apart from having me two kids, will probably something I'll take to the grave. Yeah. To the day I'll die. Cool. Tell me a few details about it then. Tell me, like, t- Brick, take yourself back there. Uh, to it, debut. When, yeah, to your debut. F- first playing for Ireland, what was, it, what was your feeling? What was it? Fly, flying over was a bit surreal. Uh, up to that point, we'd, you know, I'd not done much flying because we used to get the ferry to and from because it was, you know, it was cheaper as a family, but flying was a very big privilege for us as a family because both my mum and dad graf- were grafters, and, um, which are, I, I love and, and respect them for because it puts that, it instills in you as a person. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's important that you recognise that, but, uh, you know, the journey over on the plane and the intensity around the, the quality of training from club level and you know the caliber of players you're playing with. Like I idolised Barry McDermott and Terry Connor as a kid. You know, and they're not much older, they're not much older, they're only 10, 10 or so years older than me or 15 years older than me. But watching them as a childhood player and then getting to meet them and and then getting the honour to play with them, you know, that was surreal in itself. And but, Baz got me my, my debut year. So we were in Navan and we'd been swimming, part of a recovery program. And we got back to the hotel for a bit of lunch and we were sat there and, and Baz, were having a, Baz was sat across from me and we're having the, a yarn and having a bit of a chat about training and life and him getting to know me and me getting to know him. And then off, off the cuff, he just slammed his fork and knife down on the table and went, you're looking at my eye. And I went, no, Baz, no, no, no. And nearly fall backwards off the chair. And he went, ah, I got you. And, went, you know, and, that, and that was just a way of making me feel comfortable. Because even though I was comfortable in his presence, I was still a bit starstruck by him because of yeah. the calibre of player he was as a player. And I idolised his game because he was an enforcer. I I loved the, the rivalry he had with Fielding. You know, every game they played and every minute, I would just you know, trying to crank it up to get a reaction out of them both and <laughs> loved the punch-ups and loved the, you know, the high shots that Baz had clipping with every time and he'd come out wearing a whopper of a black eye. <laughs> and, uh, but again, it's just, it was that. And then Tez, Tez is the opposite. You know, he's, when he's on, he's on. There's no messing around and he's serious and his work mindset. And, but away from the ball, like I room with him a few times, I got the honour to room with him and just some of the chats we had, personal chats, you know, it was just overwhelming. Like very, very business mindset, very family, you know, he's a big family man like myself and, you know, just setting himself up for after rugby and, you know, his thought process around life. It really puts things into perspective and little things like that helped me on my journey become a little bit, um, a bit more selfish in terms of what I wanted to get out, what I wanted to get out of and it, and it just giving me that clarity, just wanted, made things a bit clearer, made me want it a bit more. Um, but yeah, you know, some co- Daryl Powell's a great coach, good people, man. You know, breaks your role down within the team. Was he your coach at, in that year? Yeah, yeah. my debut year, t- uh, 2004, yeah, he was the coach. And Andy Kelly was the assistant coach. And Kel did some great things over the years for Ireland. You know, he took us to the World Cup in 08, made a lot of sacrifices that year. Uh, you know, family, birthdays, anniversaries and stuff. And, you know, and, you know, it's the players and then, the, you know, some of the players we've had over the years have been unbelievable. You know, some really good marquee players, you know, quality world-class players. Who did you enjoy playing with most? Uh, You know, if there's like one guy on the field who just like couldn't do, he could do things that other people couldn't do. 
I just like to buzz and Tez whacking people. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just like enjoy carrying off the back of them because it made my life yeah. easier. Uh, but we had, you know, you, you, you Scott Grixies, your Liam Finn was a maverick. He's been a great servant for Ireland Rugby League, which, you know, I'd love to put on record. Grixie was the same. Uh, and what, what you've got to understand is that the, the players we've had over the years, when, when they start, you know, we had Benny Curry in 13, World Cup, and then he got pinched by England. And, we, and that's been always the case with our players. The temptation of the devil is, and always will be, the money and the, and the elite performance in terms of what England, England can provide compared to what we can provide, yeah. you know. I'd blow your socks off and say that our players haven't been paid for a number of years. You know, the, the, my players didn't play in the World Cup for the financial gain. They played yeah. to represent the heritage, and you know, and that's that's the that's the conflict that we've always had, and that's the that's the conflict now I've got as a coach. And you know, it's it's hard as much as they believe in what we're doing. It's hard because when you're fighting against the financial odds and. There's always going to be the winner in, when it comes to money. Mm. Um, but yeah, there's been some great people over the years in, in players and, and, and staff. And a lot of people that have done a lot of unrecognised hard work and never got mentioned. And, you know, it's, it's important. Like now with my staff, you know, or I shall say our staff is, my staff don't do this for financial gain. I don't do it for financial gain. People think I get paid a lot of money to do what I do and give up my Sundays and weekends and weekdays, planning and prepping and, you know, Zooming with my players and staff and, that all cost me personally, personal time, emotional time and financial time, which I don't get reimbursed. You know, mm. people think I'm getting paid a triple figure salary to do it. I'm not Andy Farrell. You know, I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm not in the RFU. And, but I do what I do because I'm a proud countryman and I believe my short-term sacrifices will be for long-term gain. Um, and there's a lot of people over the years that have done a, a fantastic job but never got the credit that was due uh, because as a national team, we'd never been given this spotlight to discuss things like mm. this and I think stuff like this is really important to recognise them important people and it's always the players that get spoken about but it's never about the people behind the scenes that do great work and do the stuff that keeps the sport going. So Jed, is there any uh, people you want to personally acknowledge, uh, people from your team or you know and, and what your people from the past do, you, you sort of mentioned there that you know there's people in the background who've done a lot of work for Ireland, never yeah. really had a mention, so, you know, this is probably a perfect time to, to, to mention them, really. Yeah, I think all the past players, you know, they've got us where we are today. Without them, I don't think we'd have the platform we have. Um, and I don't think I don't think they've ever been publicly thanked. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, to deliver and put the bodies on the line for, for an organisation that they play two or three games a year, you know, I, I can't thank them enough. You know, players that I've played with, players that I haven't played with, players before my time, um, so yeah, thank, very, I'm very thankful, and we as an organisation, very thankful to them, thankful to the ex coaches and the, the previous boards. Um, I stress some, um, but then, you know, and and the, and welcome to the new people coming through. You know, that's exciting. You know, I'm very thankful to my staff. I've got a great bunch of staff uh, who are all honest and and they buy into what we are trying to do as as an organisation. You know, and again, as I stressed before, they don't do it for any financial gain. It's a lot of stress and a lot of time that they could be giving the families and personal time themselves, but they choose to give it up for, for Ireland Rugby League and, you know, because they believe in the journey that we're on and where we're going and what we're doing. So just looking forward then, you know, what, what excites you about Irish Rugby League? The, the players, the, our homegrown players. You know, yes, you know, we've got... It plays globally, but I think what we've got in our on our island, you know, we need to give them a better platform to, to keep developing. But it's them homegrown players and grassroots players that really excite me. You know, we've got grassroots coaches, you know, Wayne Kerr. You know, we've got people that are on the community panel, you know, that are helping develop the game. Uh, but it's, there's there's hundreds of players there that are just hidden, not exposed or been seen yet. And they're just waiting for it to happen. But what I will say to them players is don't keep waiting for it to happen. Make it happen. You know, it won't happen unless you, you decide or choose to come and make it happen. Uh, come to that first session, I promise you, you'll fall in love like every other player that has fallen over that after that first session. And what excites me is that continuity then developing homegrown players. You know, I think, as I said before, not now, but I think in the next 10 years, we might be in a position to, to field a, a full-fledged homegrown national team in a national programme which would be very flattering as a national team uh, mm. and very patriotic for them players um, so that, that's what drives me and that's what excites me over the next 10 years um, whether I'm part of it or not you know if I, if I am 
all well and good. If I'm not, I'll still be supporting my country and, and the players that'll be pulling that green jersey because there's some things in life you're honoured and being able to do and some things that you're privileged to do. And I think getting to put that green jersey on, which you're right, they're wearing now, and it looks good on you, by the Fully way. Fully invested, mate. <laughs> I've got no Irish well. in me, though, whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's a special thing. And one that, once they get to do that, you know, it's, it's the life will take care of itself. If I said to you, where would you want Irish rugby to be, rugby league, rugby, Irish rugby league to be in 10 years? Uh, where would you like to see it? On the elite programme, playing against the best. You know, with the best, you know, you know, I, I want us to be playing in the best tier competition possible. Yeah. But, but it's all right willing or wanting to play at that elite level, but without having the stability underneath, it don't mean nothing. So again, the full package. I want to be at the top in 10 years or 15 years, but I want to be able to have the continuity for each age group and have the depth of players to select from. So people don't get stale or they don't get, you know, they don't get or don't take the position for granted that they're going to get picked. I want to have that, comp you know, the competition. I want yeah. them to feel pressured and I want them to feel, oh, oh, these kids are coming through from the 19s and I've got to keep playing well and, you know, um, so that's that's where I, you know that's what I'd like to see in 10, 15 years is that we've got each age group fulfilled in a performance and or elite level that, and we've got depth to pick from for each age group. You know, 50 plus players for each age group, 60 players if not. You know, basically what they do in the NRL and not not be like them, but want the same depth and pool of players. But by doing that, we've got to develop what we've got on our island at home and make the grassroots game better. You know, upskill the coaches, which I'm currently working with them coaches on a CPD program. Is how do I, how do I help them as coaches plan, review, you know, preview sessions? How do we then integrate this, the video sessions and stuff like that? How do we implement getting the clubs? So the board have actually implemented camcorders and laptops now to the clubs, so that you know, so they can start looking after their own stuff. And with the guidance of our coaches and myself, that we can upskill them and their upskill and help upskill the players and play at a different level. Well, Jed, it's been brilliant to chat to you, you know, not only about your playing career and the people you've played with, but, you know, your, your passion for your national team and the position you've got in that just oozes out of you. And it's been, you know, we're, we're, I'm pretty sure we've, Kyle will agree, we've both buzzed off you know, what you've been talking about. So yeah. good luck in the upcoming campaign and with all streams of, of Irish rugby. Yeah, no, thanks for having us on, guys. And, you know, to finish off, we have a motto within within our organisation, in art, Gakela Kela, no strength of that unity. And, you know, we all get branded, believe it or not, we're like cattle in that respect. We all get branded. I've got up my arms, some lads have on the chest, some lads have on the back, some lads have on the calf. But it's something that they all look forward to having, you know, they have that, having that motto. It means something that's inside the collar of the shirt, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, on the training tops that we have, we have the number 32. You know, we have the four stripes, we have the four lines for the, you know, and it's little things like that that means a lot to us. You know, it's the 32 counties and four provinces and, you know, the little detail that I've changed and implemented in my time. But, you know, coming on here and you guys give me the chance to speak and give that proper image to what the hearsays and hearsays are saying outside of our circle and the, the damage that they're causing to our sport, you know, that, that needs eradicating qu quickly and swiftly. But, you know, getting the opportunity to talk with you, great chaps, you know, helps that and helps promote the positivity around our sport and our game. And you, I know we was wrapping up, but has Ireland had a bad image put on it? Is, is that something that's happened that you, you don't you, you think he's unfair yeah massively unfair you know it, it crept in during the world cup and one thing that's left or ha, has left a bad taste in my mouth and still leaves a bad taste in my mouth there's a number of a number of people that see the game differently to what you know we as coaches and we as an organization and i say we and not i yeah because i can't do this on my own and you know i say we because we're all in it together but there's a number of people that have set up platforms, they've gone round the houses and, and that are telling a lot of lies, uh, using the manipulation of ex-players or ex, you know, to, to, to create negativity and create problems instead of coming to the source. And when they tried to come to the source and come through me, and I didn't agree with them because I'm not a yes man. Yeah. Uh, and I factually told them the facts around what I believe and, and what we believe as an organisation. And because we didn't line up on the same page, they've gone off at track and tried to manipulate the way in around the houses, you know, and, and it's it's just wrong, you know, you, you're preventing players, their decisions are impacting players playing for a country or girls from playing for their country and, you know, young boys playing for their country and, 
you know, it's it's just it's a bad light that the game doesn't need or at international level doesn't need uh, because we all live in a pressure cook as it is and we just don't need that outside noise for me. No. Well, Jed, I mean, we've spent uh, the day here at the, the Irish camp and one thing I would say that is everybody who come on board and, and we've spoken to just oozes pride yep. to wear that green jersey. Um, and like I said, like Craig said, it's been great to speak to you. Um, and I wish you all uh, the best of luck in the, in the future years to come. No, thank you. Thanks for having us. Uh, just like to thank our partners, you know, our personal partners of Ireland Rugby League, Premier Kia in Rochdale, support us massively. You know, O'Neill's our kit supplier, ATAC Sports, uh, Manuka Roofing, uh, I know who you'll know very well. Um, you know, uh, we've got some great partners on board. We're building. We're trying to, inv you know, include new people into our program to support Hotwood Our College here that support us with this training elite program, which is fantastic. For me, it's one of the best programs in the northwest. If you're a student or you're looking to get a student, get to Hotwood Hot Campus. Um, you know, it's a great facility. Here, so, you know, thanks to you guys for having us on. Thanks Cheers. very much. Cheers. Cheers. That's the final whistle for this week's episode of the Rugby League Outsiders. We hope you've enjoyed it. Don't forget to follow us on social media and share this podcast with your friends. And as always, if you have a story to tell, a club to plug or a player that deserves recognition, we want to hear from you. So until next time on the Rugby League Outsiders, take care.